Thanks. Well, um, it's always uh, great to be here. First of all, Prakash, thanks again for having me here. Uh, I appreciate the offer. It's always a great time, like family. Um, so I got the I got the easy part of this. I know Darren thinks he did, but um, let me just start with this. So this is the Basel trial. I think Darren, you did a great job of outlining the results of this trial, and the results show that there's really um, an advantage in the endovascular group first, and um, whether it has to do with amputation-free survival or overall survival, uh, although this touches one, it really does trend in favor of endovascular therapy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let me go back for a minute. I do want to point out something that uh, Darren touched on. In about three years, uh, there's a, a third of the patients are dead. So remember that for a minute. In Basel II, a third of the patients were dead in three years. Okay, so again, Darren did a great job of outlining some of the selected points related to best CLI. Um, we've already heard about this. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, but I do want to say that there were important uh, exclusions if the patient had excessive surgical risk. Now, I don't know about you, but the patients who come to me with CLTI are not you know, running marathons. And so um, this probably represents a significant portion of the uh, population that we treat. In Basel II, there were no exclusions for vein suitability and no exclusions for bypass suitability. Maybe one of the reasons there was differences. The endpoints were different. Um, and as Darren's pointed out, uh, they were meaningfully different in what they were, but they were also meaningfully different in how they were uh, determined. So best CLI had a composite endpoint of death in male but the reintervention and the need, uh, the need for reintervention and the timing of reintervention was determined by the site investigator and was not overseen by any critical limb, sorry, uh, clinically driven TLR criterion or independent adjudication. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Basel II, the primary endpoint, was more or less a body and limb count, amputation-free survival, which is much easier to adjudicate. And as already been pointed out here, uh, best CLI showed that uh, driven primarily because of major reintervention very early in the first couple of months, um, there was an advantage to surgical uh, intervention. But if you look at uh, the C graph here, this is very much the endpoint for um, uh, uh, Basel II, uh, above ankle amputation, although it's not survival. You can see the survival wasn't different between the therapies either. So if we combine just these two charts, we see that actually it was a wash between endovascular therapy and surgery uh, in the terms of amputation-free survival, if we do the back of the napkin thing here. I also point out that the length, median length of stay was twice as long in surgery as it was for stenting or endovascular therapy. Again, I point out that even in this trial, with a bit, little bit different population, about a 35% mortality rate at three years. For cohort two, as Darren uh, pointed out, there were no differences for the primary endpoint. Um, this is courtesy of of Eric Sosemski, this is um, not yet published, but um, when you look at quality of life outcomes, they favored the endovascular approach, even though there were more interventions um, in, the, uh, surgery, in the endovascular arm. So limitations of best CLI were, was, the, uh, as I mentioned before, the inclusion of an un unadjudicated major reintervention in the primary endpoint and the representativeness of non-surgical specialties. Now, why do I keep hammering on this non-adjudicated endpoint? I can guarantee, as, a, as somebody who's done a lot of trial design, I can guarantee you that the FDA had se overseen this trial, they would not have accepted that endpoint. An unadjudicated major endpoint in a trial is not acceptable. In fact, this unadjudicated major endpoint drove the <coughs> final endpoint. So in my mind, if you have 80% plus of these uh, investigators, surgeons, and they make the decision about when to re-intervene, and they're not blinded to the intervention, it's pretty tough to say that wasn't somehow biased. I'm not saying they tried to do it. I'm just saying it's not something that can be centrally over overseen and adjudicated. And as, I, as Darren mentioned, there's a 15 to 20 percent endovascular uh, failure rate, which is um, about two to three times uh, what it is in the uh, current uh, CLTI PBI studies. So it is excessive. Um, and, and it's, un, and it's, uh, it's not um, adjudicated centrally by an independent uh, kind of core lab. 86% of the investigators in this trial were vascular surgeons. I have nothing against vascular surgeons. Some of them I have, I have really friendly relationships with. 
and 75% of them were endo procedures. Now that does not represent a larger cohort of the way things are done in the United States. This is from the VQI registry 2022, and you can see 44% of procedures done by vascular surgery, but not twice the number. And if you look at it, uh, at Medicare beneficiaries, again, you see about a third of the population is, um, is treated by vascular surgery. So there was a predominance uh, out of proportion to what's done in, in, the, in the general population. Then if we look at the subset analysis, there were some, some groups that didn't necessarily show a difference between uh, the two, and I'll, I'll read them off to you because it's too small to see. There were no differences in outcomes among blacks, elderly above the age of 80, but actually close to non-significant, touching on one after the age of 67, advanced wounds, renal failure patients, either dialysis or non-dialysis patients, and patients with prior revascularization. These patients didn't uh, have a difference between the two therapies, even with what I would say was a, uh, a flawed endpoint. So what can we conclude from best CLI? Well, surgical revascularization surgically is certainly favored if the patient has adequate vein, the patient is a good surgical candidate, endovascular treatment is primarily delivered by a vascular surgeon, the patient is not patient is not black, elderly, has advanced wounds, has renal failure, or prior revascularization. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm happy to make a living on this, on this population, okay? And the reality is that this is, this is a significant portion of our population. There are other practical considerations, and I took this from, from Eric, so Eric, thank you. Without permission, I took this. Um, as I've already pointed out, in both of these trials, a third of the patients were dead in three years. This is a selected population of, of are basically in, uh, 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 trial, trial patients, typically better than the average bear. If we look at mortality across the board rated by frailty, this is a frail group, this is, the, uh, this is the, a non-frail group, and you look at this, again, we have a 20 to 30 to 40 percent mortality at one year. How should our CLTI patients spend their remaining time? This is not a philosophic question. Should they spend it getting a one-night length of stay and come, going home for an endovascular procedure? Should they spend it se spending several weeks of the remaining time with uh, surgical wound uh, recovery, which was, by the way, reflected in the uh, patient uh, reported outcomes? Secondly, there are probably not there are not probably not of vascular surgeons in operating rooms to treat the epidemic of critical limb ischemia. I mean, that's just a fact of life. We are under treating it today, and you can see by this map the darker the, the darker areas show the folks who did get an angiogram an evaluation before amputation, and the lighter ones or the ones that are not colored in uh, either didn't have data or not being seen prior to amputation. So there's a, there's a dearth of care being delivered to the critical limb patient today, and I don't think there's enough vascular surgeons in operating rooms to do this as a primary therapy. And thirdly, this becomes an issue because in, uh, if you look at the distribution of critical limb ischemia, it, it tends to predominate in blacks. And so now, if you combine that with my second point, it becomes a lack of access and an equity issue. So what about the central question? Does endovascular intervention remain a viable option for the management of CLTI? Well, the resounding answer is yes. That's based on the Basel II results, which pretty much show that there, it was superior. So the significant limitations of the best CLI trial conduct, which include endpoint adjudication, a non-representative operator pool, predominance of males, I didn't talk about that, but only 26% of patients in there were females, and underutilization of antiproliferatives, which you've already heard about. The best CLI subgroup analysis, which had a lot of specific groups that weren't necessarily benefited, the number of non-operative, non-vein CLTI patients, that is patients who couldn't uh, qualify for an operation, high early mortality, and the broad clinical need in this population. So in my pre oh, in patient preference, which was highlighted by Romy earlier, so what I would represent is that as an operator, I've incorporated best CLI into my practice by the fact that if I take a, a critical inpatient to the lab, I map their veins, assuming they're a reasonable surgical candidate. If I see complex disease, multi-level, long C CTO of, of SFA, things like that, I completely agree with Darren. I think they should get a vein graft bypass. Uh, otherwise, I'll generally proceed with endovascular approach, and I incorporate patient preference and life expectancy into the sum of this decision making. It is much more nuanced than the single trial or single debate answer that we're trying to be forced into. This is a very complex um, population with lots of needs and considerations. Thank you very much.